very much. Uh, our next uh, presenter is Professor Harry Fox, uh, PhD at Hebrew University, um, um, originator of the idea of the embarrassment of scripture, um, and he's our first respondent. Thank you. <clears throat> I benefited from a, a, a very closely uh, argued 50-page paper, uh, but to some extent that had not so much to do with what you told us today uh, to start your talk, which was Torah Shabal Peh in, in its best uh, format. And so um, I have very little to say, actually, on, on what you spent maybe the majority of your uh, presentation this morning. But I, I, I uh, will try to make a few small, uh, both summarize and, and make some comments on your on the actual paper that I had before me. Um, in the story told by uh, 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 Yosef David of the rise and fall of the Karite catenary theory, uh, I haven't looked that uh, word up, I have to say, uh, of forbidden marriages, he tells a convincing one which also traces the idea of kinship affinity to what is also found in uh, uh, ancient uh, Christian churches. In contradistinction, rabbinic law totally rejected the use of kias, hermeneutic rules of analogy when applied to incest laws. In other words, they have plenty of laws of analogy, but not when applied to uh, incest laws. As David, uh, as David thoroughly annotates the story, it is long on details, but short as it should be, on speculation. Well, I mean, you started today with speculation, so I can't really say that in terms of today's presentation. Yet, as I can hardly add to his thorough detailed study, I must the last turn to speculation. Uh, David does not really fully address the rabbinite, uh, rabbinite uh, stance, which indeed did add to the biblical list of forbidden marriages, some 20 additional ones. For example, look at Rambam, Yilchot Ishu, to one... Uh, six. Nonetheless, they did not go as far as the Karaites in adding additional kinship groups to these forbidden groups via catenation, which is a theory of linking. It seems to me that if we adhere to some contemporaneous developments in the area of forbidden marriages in current Canadian law, we may chance on a reasonable trajectory of speculation for antiquity as well. Canada, with its basic charter of human rights, strongly advocates for the removal of restraints to the marriage or cohabitation of any and all consenting adults. Hence, the law of forbidden unions in Canada, just recently revised, uh, reads as follows in its Marriage uh, Prohibited Degrees Act. No person shall marry another person if they are related line linearly, or as a brother or sister or half-brother or half-sister, including by adoption. So, for example, an uncle and a nephew can get married in Canada. Just to get, I want to purposely give something that was maybe surprising. What has been removed from this list in its efforts to become an inclusive secular list, as opposed to an <coughs> exclusive religious document, is still found in Great Britain, where there is no separation of church and state. Included in their list are uncle, aunt, nephew, or niece. Scotland's incest laws include specific mention of Leviticus 18. There are states in the United States of America where one is still prohibited from marrying one's first cousin. In contradistinction, marriage to first cousins constitutes some 20% of all marriages worldwide according to Professor Google. <laughs> what results from uh, this is that incest laws may both expand or contract depending on the social mores of the time. Almost all these forbidden values, <coughs> for example, were permitted, even promoted, in Zoroastrianism, as recently demonstrated by Ishai Kiyo. For, for a fence around the biblical law with a severe view of sex between close kin, the sages are, as mentioned above, added to the list. The Karaites, however, went one better by expanding the list through analogies. Eventually, given relatively small populations, the Karaites obviously would have ended up with next to no one to marry. 
Now, how small the populations were, especially at the beginning of charism, is now is, is, is a matter of controversy between scholars. But using the Hollywood method of six, six degrees of separation, it doesn't take very long for everyone to be connected. At that point, the catenary theory of relationships uh, fell apart under the severe weight of its own self-imposed restrictions. Uh, Yeshua ben Yehuda, in uh, um, Sources for Women and Incest Rules among the Karaites, Sefer Yashar or Sefer Arayot, uh, this position uh, says the following, uh, um, you, you know, is, is the start of the counterattack on the catenary theory. Um, uh, this has been uh, a bit um, uh, problematized by a debate as to whether uh, Yeshua himself transgressed the catenary rules of his time in his own marriage um, and, um, and whether the communities are small or not small in his time. So what motivates uh, the matter is under some debate of scholarship. And that I'm not going to go into here. Uh, and neither, neither did uh, David essentially go into that. Um, this position, derived by more direct means, is summarized in the note of uh, Pirkei Tovia ben Simcha Levi Babovich by Rav Yosef Algamil. And, and this is, so I'm quoting from this, uh, this footnote by uh, uh, Algamil. Uh, so it's a contemporary summary of a, a, an internal Karaite view on the history of their uh, catenary theorists, or uh, catenarians, I would say. The catenary theorists are our ancient sages who had a tendency for stringencies, considered the man and the woman to be one body, relying on the first, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and cling to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Genesis 2.24, and we just heard about it. They prohibited all the male's relatives and all of the female's relatives. And for this reason, there would be incidents where one man who wanted to partner up with a woman would be unable to find anyone within his community who would not fall under the prohibition. And this is one of the reasons that the Karaites decreased in population in the world. Uh, <clears throat> the opinion of the catenary theorist was the act of halacha for approximately, and here uh, one can dispute this, but for 600 years, beginning with our master and nun, uh, the prince, until the time of our master Yosef Haro'er, and our master Yeshua, the great teacher and author of Sefer Ayashar, as we've heard. Indeed, despite this uh, abandonment, the opinions of the catenary theorists was the actual halacha for a certain while longer until the days of Rabbeinu Yisrael HaDayan, Ben Shmuel HaMaravi, and his disciple Rabbi Yefe Taro Fe HaTzair, see Likutei Kadmoniot of Pinsker, who uprooted this opinion and abrogated it completely. There is some disagreement amongst, scholar, among scholars as to exactly when the Karait uh, world abandoned the Kapanari theory. According to David, uh, it began with the nun in the uh, mid-8th century, had its golden age in the 10th century with Kirtisani, uh, Levi ben Yefet, Yehuda ben Elio Hadassi in the 11th century, and is uh, more or less eliminated by Yeshua ben Yehuda in the latter half of the 11th century. And David mentions this on the, all throughout his, his paper. And is further reduced by Elijah Ben Moshe Bashiachi, in uh, the great collator of, I mean, he's the Rambam of the Karaites, one might say, in the 15th century, uh, uh, in his uh, uh, codes of law. As mentioned above, Al Gamil sees the catenary theory as the uh, halacha well beyond Yeshua ben Yehuda, ending with Rabbi Yefetar Rofe Hatzayir. Uh, the matter was further complicated uh, by scholars, as I mentioned above, who understood that Yeshua had abrogated the catenary theory because he himself had transgressed it. More accurate is the evidence available from the Cairo Gnesa that may reflect an attack on Yeshua as well as those who continue to abide by the catenary theory well after Yeshua, uh, though eventually a system prevailed. And 
so these are uh, the the uh, um, uh, the Geniza fragments. Of course, were mentioned by other scholars that uh, uh, that were, didn't form part of uh, David's paper. There is considerable evidence on frequent so-called intermarriage between rabbinites and Karaites before Maimonides put a damper on such a freedom by claiming all the Karaites to be potentially illegitimate due to his attack on their writ of divorce. Not surprisingly, this had its counterpart in a Karaite counterclaim that all rabbinites were to be considered bastards because of the controversy over incest law. Hence, it was prohibited, prohibited to marry them. As a considerable number of additional early dated Karite documents uh, were stolen from the Saltikov Shedrin Library in St. Petersburg, now, this part of the story will likely eventually be enriched with newly rediscovered relevant documentation from the Cairo Gniza once these documents resurface. At some point, they'll resurface. The other area I would like to comment on is the biblical expression, one flesh, for which David indicates that the verse's meager treatment in rabbinic literature is perplexing. According to the Karaites, this verse refers to the progeny uh, produced by the copulating couple, which is also at the heart of the theory of catenation. When we have he what we have here, at least so it seems to me, as a case of embarrassment, uh, with the idea that Adam and Eve already had sexual congress in the Garden of Eden. Such ideas of sex in paradise persist to this day, and the myth that Muslims who reach heaven will be rewarded with 50 virgins, and other ideas of that sort. If, however, you are willing to tolerate the idea that Adam and Eve had sexual congress in the Garden, or be persuaded by the Midrash that has the snake have become uncontrollably jealous after witnessing their sexual activity, then one need not go beyond the same <coughs> plane of the biblical text. Sex in the garden is, um, is present. It is also where the two elders lust after Susanna in the apocryphal book, and it is the scene where <coughs> the lover and beloved, mystically I may add, unite in the Song of Songs. One area not uh, discussed by David is how the Arayot uh, became considered to be amongst the seven Noahide laws, which has been a central text in debates about natural law in Judaism. This is the case because we find near universality surrounding such laws. Hence, those who do not abide, for example, uh, ancient Zoroastrians, by them are considered to be in violation of the law, transgressors who have sinned. Yet, the Karait Arayot of Sefer Ayashar explicitly denies the, inherently ra the inherent rationality of the, uh, of the Arayot. Ein lo ikar that's a quote. And David brings us. David uh, cites Nachmanides on Leviticus 18.6 as further support for this notion that I'm not so sure about. And my only comment for today is how do you account for Rambam, who has perhaps no uh, concept of the law as revealed. So, thank you.